This is Latter-day Presentations, where we discuss topics and issues of faith for Latter-day Saints. Welcome to today's presentation. Let's talk about imaginary Jesus versus the revealed Christ. What do I mean by imaginary Jesus? We find imaginary Jesus most often in social media posts. Let's look at some examples. What is this behavior? Look at these examples from Twitter. Here someone says Jesus was an enemy of the state. He still is. He made a whip out of cords and drove out the money changers. He associated with lepers when it was forbidden. He refused orders, fought the state, fought authoritarianism, and promoted peace. Another person says when Jesus expelled the money changers from the temple, he said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. The very same money changers gather this week for the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos. We must do as Jesus did and drive them from our countries. Here's another post. Jesus would have stormed into the upcoming NRA convention and knocked over the money changers' tables. And he would have spit in the eye of all those politicians getting paid to give speeches. I love that Jesus. Here's another, but anger is okay. He braided a whip and chased the money changers from the temple. What else are preachers doing now? Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder. I doubt it was because they were exceedingly polite. And finally, Texas Democrat candidate, Pat, I'd like to solve the puzzle. Matthew 21, verse 12, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those woke selling doves. What do we see here with these posts? We see a number of people who have taken a story in the Gospels about Jesus and him overturning the tables of the money changers. And they've repurposed that story to tell a story about what Jesus would do now. And it happens to conform exactly to their political views. If I hold strong political views and I have some basic awareness of some Bible stories, of course I can repurpose those for my political ends. And I can make God in my hateful image. Like pretending Jesus had enemies and pretending our enemies are people Jesus would have considered his enemies. Look at these examples. The Pharisees released the guilty, Barabbas, and crucified the innocent, Jesus. Same as today's Democrats. Or when Jesus came the first time, he abhorred religion and legalism. Mormons are modern-day Pharisees. There, I said it. Or why does the Christian right support Republicans? Jesus admonished the Pharisees they pile heavy burdens on people's shoulders and won't lift a finger to help, like additional stimulus and PPP. Everything they do is just to show off, a photo op holding a Bible. What would Jesus do, guys? Now, I'm just going to pause here for a moment and say, anytime someone on social media asks that question, what would Jesus do? It's a good rule of thumb to assume that they're trying to manipulate you in some way. But let's look at this final post. Jesus was so against the establishment creating rules at every turn, like the GOP using the Bible, he said the entire Bible is wrapped into one word, love. Love God with all your heart, your neighbor like yourself, and yourself. That erases all judgment. And let's look at some more examples of Jesus as a tool for emotional manipulation. Here's a social media post from someone who gave an address at the Mormon History Association. He says, Today I gave an address to the Mormon History Association on LDS climate action and earth stewardship, or the lack thereof. What would the Mormon Jesus do? And you can see he ran a search on the church website that returned zero results for whatever he was searching for. Another example, did you tell them, Chuck Grassley, that you were awarded the Gun Lobby's Legislator of the Year Award for blocking all gun safety reform? Did you tell them you value assault weapons more than the lives of little children? What would Jesus do, Senator? And finally, Franklin Graham posted a piece today about student loan forgiveness and how Jesus paid a debt for us that he didn't owe so that we could have life eternal. I am against paying it off because a person takes out a loan, they should pay it. But what would Jesus do? 
Again, I'm going to reiterate, when people ask this question on social media, what would Jesus do? You can generally assume that they are trying to emotionally manipulate you. It's a question that's used to shame people of faith. And it's an example of our tendency to use the scriptures as a club to beat down people that we hate. If I want to pretend that my enemies are Jesus's enemies, here's the logic that I might employ. I'd start by saying that Jesus hates Pharisees, and then say that I hate group X, and I want my hate to have some authority. And so I'll make my group X into a group that Jesus hates by calling them Pharisees. There are obvious problems with this logic, though. Jesus did not hate Pharisees. And rather than give our hate some authority, it's better to repent of our hate. But when we don't examine this logic critically, we end up with posts like these. Republicans who are angry about student loan debt forgiveness sure sound an awful lot like the Pharisees. Why do they have so much trouble with the concept of grace? Perhaps they need to do some soul searching? Or the Democrats are the Pharisees of today, telling everyone how virtuous they and how better they are than everyone else. In reality, they are empty inside with no virtue at all. And then finally, point being, Catholics get to live in this high and mighty self-important position, judging everyone else in the same manner as the Pharisees, because the hundreds of Protestant denominations are largely disorganized in their local churches, a beautiful thing, actually fostering discipleship. Now, these are the voices of ordinary people on social media. And we might ask the question, what about people with deep knowledge of the New Testament, like New Testament scholars? Well, they're really not any better. New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson said this about historical Jesus studies. He said, a pile of pieces does not by itself yield a satisfying picture of Jesus. It is necessary to fit these pieces into an alternative framework than the one provided by the Gospels. At this point, the subjective character of the entire enterprise becomes evident. The framework chosen often reveals as much about the investigator as it does about Jesus. When scholars, all using the same methods and studying the same materials, derive such a variety of quote-unquote historical Jesuses, a revolutionary zealot, a cynic radical, an agrarian reformer, a gay magician, a charismatic cult reformer, a peasant, a guru of oceanic bliss, then one may well wonder whether anything more than a sophisticated and elaborate form of projection has taken place. Now, what does Professor Johnson mean by projection? Projection is a term in psychology that describes a tendency that we have to project our own motives and ideas onto other people and assume that other people are motivated by the same things that we are. The social media posts that we have looked at so far in this presentation are wonderful examples of projection. I love this humorous article from the satire site, The Babylon Bee. Jesus was a socialist deconstructionist feminist, claims socialist deconstructionist feminist scholar. And another one, Amazing. After careful study, man concludes Jesus would have all the same political positions that he does. In these articles, what are they describing? They're describing projection, and specifically our tendency to use projection in a way that makes God, and specifically Jesus, into kind of like a sock puppet created in our own image. He thinks exactly like I do, tells me all the things I want to hear, never challenges me, and always validates me. And I want to reiterate that biblical scholars have this tendency just as much as anyone else. Here's non-believing scholar John Dominic Crossan on historical Jesus studies. He says, historical Jesus research is becoming something of a scholarly bad joke. There were always historians who said it could not be done because of historical problems. There were always theologians who said it should not be done because of theological objections. And there were always scholars who said the former when they meant the latter. Those, however, were negative indignities. What is happening now is a rather positive one. It is the number of competent and even eminent scholars producing pictures of Jesus at wide variance with one another. He says it is impossible to avoid the suspicion that historical Jesus research is a very safe place to do theology and call it history. 
to do autobiography and call it biography. That's a clever description of that tendency toward projection that we see even among very competent scholars. And Crossan is part of this field that we call historical Jesus studies. This field has a history, and it's broadly divided into three quests for the historical Jesus. There was one from about 1800 to 1900, where scholars were denying the supernatural elements of the gospel accounts, and they started to apply just a simple historian's tool set to the gospels. And then we have the second quest for the historical Jesus, where they developed more specific criteria, trying to come up with a way of determining whether different passages in the Gospels were authentic to Jesus or not. And that was exemplified in the work of the Jesus Seminar, where scholars would gather together and look at criteria and actually raise their hand for a vote on what they thought Jesus actually said and did in the Gospels. But the third historical Jesus quest was kind of different. It focused on the Jewish context of Jesus. And what does that mean? It means they understood that Jesus was Jewish and that that should be a starting point for any discussion of what he might have thought, what he might have said, or what he might have done, as scholars critically examine the texts of the Gospels. And another difference is the third quest for the historical Jesus had some awareness of the problems of subjectivity in the whole field of historical Jesus studies. And let's talk about what does it mean that Jesus was a first century Jew? Well, he had the worldview of a first century Jew. He lived the law, he viewed Moses as authoritative, he loved the temple, he called it my father's house. And it's worth noting that Herod's temple was an extravagant, expensive structure built with slave labor. Jesus did not hold modern views of anything. That's another important starting point as we try to paint a picture of how Jesus thought and how he engaged with the world. And with this understanding, we need to engage with this question of how reliable are these portraits of Jesus that are painted by activists, like people offering commentary on social media or even in academia. If my view of Jesus is an activist construct, I can ask this question, is my activist construct of Jesus based in reality? And how would I go about determining that? Well, I could do an exercise. I could actually study first century Judaism, which was Jesus's religion. And I could explore all the elements of Jesus's religion that I find offensive. Elements of his scriptures, the practices in his religion, and also his culture and worldview. And then I could look for examples where Jesus campaigned and protested against all of those elements of his religion that I find offensive. And I should say, spoiler alert, I'm not going to find very much, unless I'm willing to employ very creative and delusional thought processes in order to maintain my imaginary activist construct of Jesus. And now let's talk about another tendency that we sometimes have. And we sometimes see this among Latter-day Saints, and I call it minimalist imaginary Jesus. And this is a tendency to reduce Jesus and his views to the very bare minimum of concepts and principles that I can tolerate. So sometimes people invoke 3 Nephi 11 in an effort to dismiss the overwhelming majority of restoration revelation about Jesus. We have these passages in 3 Nephi 11, Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine, and whoso buildeth upon this buildeth upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. And whoso shall declare more or less than this, and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil, and is not built upon my rock, but he buildeth upon a sandy foundation. And the gates of hell stand open to receive such, when the floods come and the winds beat upon them. If I use these passages to create a minimal set of Jesus' teachings that I will consider binding upon me, there's a problem with that, because Third Nephi has a lot more. It has an exhortation to give heed to ordained apostles. It has the higher law. It has sayings. It has teachings about the house of Israel. It has warnings. It has specific teachings on the sacrament, on prayer and miracles. It has restoration prophecies. It has an exposition of Isaiah and Malachi. It has a specific commandment to modify scripture and a commandment regarding the name of the church. All of these elements of 3 Nephi were just as binding as everything that Jesus said in 3 Nephi 11. And moreover, we're told 
And now there cannot be written in this book even a hundredth part of the things which Jesus did truly teach unto the people. And Mormon tells us, And when they shall have received this, which is expedient that they should have first to try their faith, and if it shall so be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them under their condemnation. Mormon is referring to a spiritual law that we first saw in Alma 12. And the law goes like this. If we are open to receiving more, and if we are willing to believe in more, then God will give us more. By contrast, if we're incapable of believing the things we have received, then we will not be given more. In fact, things that we have received will be taken from us. So sometimes this tendency toward minimalist imaginary Jesus is done out of kind of a fear or a self-protection mechanism but it shouldn't be our spiritual goal. Our goal should always be to be able to receive more and more of what God has to offer us. And sometimes imaginary Jesus is invoked as an enabler of apostasy. He's used to lead people off the covenant path. As with most apostasy, this follows a simple and predictable formula. Number one, establish a false artificial standard of perfection for church leadership. Number two, Dismiss the witness testimony of church leaders about Christ's involvement in the decision-making of the church's governing councils. Number three, imagine a Jesus in my own image, supported by selective use of scriptures and scholarship. Number four, invoke my imaginary Jesus to undermine ordained leaders and reveal doctrines. And finally, use my imaginary Jesus to feel validated in my apostasy. This is a pretty simple formula that's commonly employed among people who want to use imaginary Jesus to validate their apostasy. But we don't have to do things like this. Let's do this instead. Let's ask the question, how do people behave when they don't know Christ? Well, they project and they talk about him in the abstract. They selectively interpret scriptures of the distant past to speak with dogmatic certainty about how Jesus supports their thinking in the present day. It's a form of idolatry. By contrast, how do people behave when they know Christ? They speak with reverence. They speak from personal experience. They aren't motivated by hate. And they are open to correction. Look at this social media quote from President Nelson and contrast it with the ones that we read earlier. He said, Since last general conference, difficulties in the world have continued. The global pandemic still affects our lives. And now the world has been rocked by a conflict that is reigning terror on millions of innocent men, women, and children. Prophets have foreseen our day when there would be wars and rumors of wars, and when the whole earth would be in commotion. Brothers and sisters, the gospel of Jesus Christ has never been needed more than it is today. Conflict violates everything the Savior stood for and taught. I love the Lord Jesus Christ and testify that his gospel is the only enduring solution for peace. His gospel is a gospel of peace. His gospel is the only answer when many in the world are stunned with fear. We have the sacred responsibility to share the power and peace of Jesus Christ with all who will listen and who will let God prevail in their lives. The spiritual darkness in the world makes the light of Jesus Christ needed more than ever. Everyone deserves the chance to know about the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Every person deserves to know where they can find the hope and peace that passes all understanding. Again, I would invite you to contrast this social media post with the ones that we read earlier, where people were invoking the name of Jesus in the service of their personal hatreds and their political rivalries. And let's turn to another question now. How do we seek the living Christ versus imaginary Jesus? Well, to know the living Christ, we look at a variety of sources. I would suggest these, personal experiences, the experiences of others, personal revelation, scripture, scripture scholarship, and witness testimony of his ordained servants. What do I mean by that last one? Let's look at an example. Here's Elder Neil L. Anderson on Twitter. He said, Your faith in Jesus Christ is not in vain. You will see him again. All the world will know he is the Son of God. I have come to know him and feel his presence. I witness with certainty that he lives, that he is resurrected, and that his love for us is beyond description. I testify to you that through sacred experiences, special moments, 
precious and powerful feelings, I have a sureness to my knowledge that Jesus is the Christ, that he lives, that he is resurrected. He is exactly who we proclaim him to be. Now, what happens if we reject and eliminate some of these sources and just focus on scripture and scripture scholarship? Well, we end up with the ability to create Jesus in our own image. Our sources become my feelings, my thoughts, and proof-texted scriptures. And we end up with that sock puppet of Jesus created in my own image who only ever validates me and tells me what I already believe. Our choice is between an abstract, imaginary, self-serving Jesus idol created in my image or the living Christ. How do we sound when we're talking about one versus the other? With the imaginary Jesus idol, we say things like, Jesus thinks like me because he said this once in the New Testament. When we're talking about the living Christ, we say things like, Christ said this in the New Testament, and he communicated similar things in Restoration Scripture and through his servants in recent General Conference. Going back to imaginary Jesus, we say things like, Jesus hates the people I hate. Versus, Christ loves every child of God. I can see this in the words and demeanor of his living prophet. How about, Jesus agrees with my politics? Versus, Christ's kingdom is not of this world, and his servants are emphatic that people of different political persuasions are welcome. Or, Jesus shares all my priorities. Versus, Christ's priorities are revealed or they are unknown. They often surprise me. Or Jesus talks to me constantly and always affirms me. Versus, I hear his voice, but only when I am seeking stillness and openness to discerning his ways of thinking over my own thoughts and feelings. And a common theme in my presentations is the value of the church's counsel system in arriving at that discernment that goes beyond any individual's thoughts and feelings. I'll reiterate this quote from James E. Faust. This requirement of unanimity in church councils provides a check on bias and personal idiosyncrasies, which amounts to a check on our tendency to engage in projection. It ensures that God rules through the Spirit, not man through majority or compromise. It ensures that the best wisdom and experience is focused on an issue before the deep, unassailable impressions of revealed direction are received. It guards against the foibles of man. And I'll repeat against our tendency to engage in projection. Sister Bonnie H. Corden says, This is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is a remarkable thing to remember that it is His Church. As we seek to know His will, as men and women come together, listening to each other and listening to the Spirit, revelation flows. I can't repeat or reinforce this point enough. This council system is an extremely valuable system for guarding against our tendencies to project and to create God in our own image. And in conclusion, I want to say we don't need an imaginary Jesus. Using an imaginary personal construct of quote-unquote Jesus, usually created in our own image, as a tool to justify sin or a particular ideological agenda is a form of breaking the third commandment to not use the name of God in vain. We can come to know Christ personally with a firm commitment to his law. Listen to how Christ associates knowing him with our commitment to live his law. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out spirits and in your name done many miracles? I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. And finally, another way that we come to personally know the living Christ is through loving service to others. In the Book of Mormon, we read, For how knoweth a man the master whom he has not served, and who is a stranger unto him, and is far from the thoughts and intents of his heart? King Benjamin also tells us, When ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. In Doctrine and Covenants 46, we read that one of the spiritual gifts in the church is for some people to know through the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the Christ. I don't have very many spiritual gifts, but that is one of my spiritual gifts. And one of the reasons that I so strongly sustain the leadership of the church in our day is that I can sense that same conviction in them and in the ways that they go about serving in their callings. 
And as I wind down this presentation, I would encourage all of the viewers of this presentation to seek out and take seriously the witness testimony of the leadership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints regarding the reality of the revealed Christ. And I encourage my viewers to give heed to the things that they are teaching us in our day. Thank you for joining me. This has been an episode of Latter-day Presentations. We would like to remind viewers that our channel represents our own views and not necessarily any official positions of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We hope this presentation has been informative. Our notes for this show are at Nauvoo Neighbor and the link can be found in the show description. Also in the show description, we have a link to provide feedback. If you would like to suggest a topic for discussion, or if you would like to contribute a presentation on a topic of interest to you, let us know. Thanks again for joining us.